welcome everybody to the digital services user group meeting for CLRC. Uh, normally this would be an in-person event. We would have all of you in our conference room. And uh, when I was designing the event a few years ago, I really saw it as much as a networking event as uh, an opportunity for me to go through and update everybody on, on all of our platforms and everything that's happened over the course of the last year. Uh, but since the pandemic, uh, that's not really practical. So unfortunately, we'll uh, make the best of it on Zoom and uh, you know go from there. Uh, and normally we'd also be serving you guys all lunch. Um, so I apologize uh, that lunch will not be served at this time. Uh, so many of you um, probably already know me, but my name is Ryan Perry. I'm the digital collections librarian here at the Central New York Library Resources Council. Uh, so what that means is I am responsible for all of the digital platforms, um, digitization, cultural heritage uh, work that our um, organization does. Uh, I work, of course, with um, the rest of the CLRC staff to do um, a number of other things as well, but that's the main thing I do here at CLRC. Um, I, so as we're, as we're getting started here, uh, here's, here's the agenda for what I hope to get through um, in the next couple hours. Uh, a lot of this event will be the platform overview and update. I am recording this entire event and my plan is to make available after the fact the recording of the majority of the event. The part that I'm not going to make available but I'm recording just so I don't have to take notes is the uh, focus group at the end. So that also um, plays into what I said before, where if you have to go to another meeting, if you have to go on a CERC desk, if you have to do anything, um, it's okay. And I fully understand people will be coming and going throughout this. I had a number of people email me to that effect as well. And that's perfectly fine. I'll make sure everybody gets a link to the recording after the fact. It'll probably be sometime next week. Um, and I'm not recording the end because I want everybody to feel free to share their opinions and not be um, on the record, so to speak, uh, with um, you know publicly available video. Um, so a few other uh, kind of housekeeping things. Because we're um, not in person, uh, it's a little bit harder to interrupt me if you have questions, but um, the easiest way to do so is to um, have just type something in the chat. If you look at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on which layout you have from Zoom, um, there'll be a button to open the chat window. And if you chat at everyone, everybody will see your, your question. And um, I'm going to try my best to keep an eye on it as I'm going through. So hopefully I will get to your question. And feel free to interrupt me. It doesn't, you know, if you ask a question you know, at the very end about something specific to what we were talking about on a certain slide, then that's a little bit harder to get back to. Um, so please uh, send me a chat. Uh, again, if you didn't hear at the beginning, if you um, are able to rename yourself, um, you, you do this by going to participants and finding your name and hovering over more and hit rename and rename yourself with the name of your institution at the end. Um, that way, especially since we won't be able to um, do introductions, it's kind of hard to do in Zoom. Um, you can, we can all know where we where we are. Um, that helps a little bit when we discuss. Okay, I think that's all of the the housekeeping I had. So just a really quick run through of the agenda here. Um, the majority of the next while is going to be this platform overview and update. I'm going to start at the very beginning. I realize that many of you and at least one or two people who registered might be, um, you know, new new to CLRC. Um, there's one one person registered who wasn't even a member yet. Um, so I will do my best to start at the beginning and explain things. Um, but then also for those of you who already know all this, um, a lot of our time is also going to be spent going through the updates. So what has happened over the course of the last year. Um, I'm not always as good about the, communicating this incrementally, so this event also helps me to kind of get through all the news news headlines that you might have missed over the course of the last year of all the things we're doing behind the scenes. Um, so that'll be the first section of the day. Uh, 
I'm going to do a 10 minute break between that and our mini workshop. I'm calling it on digital dark archive. Um, the digital dark archive is a newer service that we're starting to roll out more um, broadly. So I want to give more of an in-depth um, discussion of what the mechanics of that are, what the value of it is, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, get all of you thinking about how it, it you know, might, might be able to use it um, going forward. Um, and then finally, this is our year for um, submitting a new plan of service, five-year plan of service to the state as part of our, um, you know, arrangement with the Department of Library Development. And so it's really important for us that we're not only asking questions of our broader membership in a general forum, but also talking to more specific groups like you all today and asking, you know, what you would like to see from CLRC over the course of the next five years. Um, I realize that's a big question. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around it, um, but hopefully we can have some discussion at the end. And I have a few questions to prompt um, some, some thoughts about that. Um, so that'll be at the very end of the, the, the day. I'm going to go through things relatively quickly. Um, I realize I'm speaking really fast right now. I will try not to speak quite this fast the whole time if I can help it. But um, there's a good chance we won't take the full three hours until four o'clock. That's, that's my goal anyway. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it all goes. And I, again, I promise we'll have breaks in between. All right. Um, and again, if, if you have questions about anything, just send them in the chat um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so we're, we'll start out with this platform overview and updates. Um, these are the main platforms that we um, operate in, in, in uh, for, for CLRC, main, main services that we offer to our members. So we'll start with the big one, um, at least what, what consumes a lot of my time. Uh, New York Heritage Digital Collections, um, as many of you probably already know, is a statewide repository for cultural heritage materials. And the real focus of, of New York Heritage is on providing access to the general public. So this is a platform where all of the great historical materials that you all have uh, can be shared with anybody with an internet uh, connection. It's, it's, um, there's no um, paywall or, or other hindrance for people to use it. Um, and it's uh, a really general resource for uh, a great variety of materials. Uh, so the way we have this um, within New York State, um, we have nine library councils of which CLRC is one. We each serve a different set of counties across the state. CLRC serves Onondaga, Herkimer, Madison, and Oneida. I always say that in a different order, but those four counties. Um, and each council uh, handles this process on behalf of their members. So you are all in my region, so I'm your contact for getting materials uploaded to New York Heritage and any other issues you might have with it. Uh, just to give you a sense for the, the scale of what New York Heritage represents, we have um, well over a million items or pages, so individual pages of a yearbook would count as, as one, one page um, or item, as well as a postcard or a photograph or whatever. Um, and of those, we have 304 discrete objects. So in that case, in that scenario, a yearbook would only count once. Um, so we have a large number of materials in New York Heritage, and um, it's really pretty, pretty remarkable how much has, has been uploaded by you all. Uh, of those materials, approximately 29,000 objects are just from our region alone. Um, so, you know, that, that number's been growing. I can't remember the exact number from last year, but it's, the objects have grown by at least 3,000 3, over the course of the last year. So we're, we're definitely going up. We're, we're busy uploading a lot of materials. Um, in total, there are 370 institutions um, from eight of the nine library councils that participate in the project. So Metropolitan New York has their own separate repository, Digital Culture of Metropolitan New York. Um, although they do have some um, objects still in New York Heritage when they were participants, um, they aren't formally um, a member of the, the project. Um, and of those 370, 53 
institutions are from our, our organization, or sorry, our region, so our four counties, um, which is one of the larger um, participation rates amongst the councils. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a project that consumes a lot of my time. Um, not only am I the local um, liaison or, or, or uh, administrator for New York Heritage, I also help coordinate the project on a statewide basis. So um, I work with my colleagues from across the state to um, make incremental improvements, of which I'm gonna go through a few of them in a minute. Um, I know I saw at least one of my colleagues, uh, or two of my colleagues on, um, Claire Lovell is um, my counterpart at South, South Central Regional Library Council and somewhere, if I scroll down, Ryan Hughes is my counterpart at Rochester. So they're just sitting in to kind of see, see what we're, we're doing today. Um, but uh, I, I work very closely with all of them um, to, to make some improvements and do what we can amongst all the other things we have going on. Uh, so uh, moving on to updates. Uh, so the one of the bigger ones that we have coming up is we are in the midst of building a new website again. I know it seems like we just launched our new website a couple of years ago, um, but the underlying platform, the content management system that runs the front end of our website, so all the landing pages, all the um, collection institution landing pages, that's um, Drupal 7 and that's re reaching its end of life it was going to be November of next year, but it's going to be, the, they pushed it back here with the pandemic. But either way, our, our basically uh, the support for, for our platform is being sunsetted. So we are jumping ship to Drupal 8, which sounds like you can just hit the update button, but it's really much more complicated than that. We're um, basically rebuilding the entire site from scratch. Um, that's not a content level thing. So like the content will all be ported over, but in terms of the structure of the site, we're, we're starting over. Um, our intention is to do a pretty light redesign of the front end. We're not going to be really rebranding or doing anything too crazy there. Um, but the entire back end, like I mentioned, in the metadata management, all the collection and institution level metadata is all being rebuilt. Hopefully this will fix um, a lot of the issues, which hopefully many of you haven't experienced. But um, we had this weird Rube Goldberg um, machine where we had different databases feeding data everywhere. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but basically that has caused a lot of um, issues for our library council staff in making updates. So hopefully by rebuilding it, we're going to build it, build it back better. Um, I didn't mean to say that as a campaign <laughs> slogan of Joe Biden, but we're, 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 that's essentially what we're doing here. Um, so uh, this will hopefully also make the website faster and more stable and all that. But we'll see, because we're still in early stages. We'd originally hoped to have this new website launched by, um, I sa it says December 2019, but that is a typo. By December 2020, um, we're, we're, there's no way we're going to have it done by then. We'll, it'll be sometime next year. Um, so December 2019 would have been nice, because then it'd be over. Uh, so you probably will hear more about this later on. Um, but just have, have, a, have a sense that it's coming down. Hopefully it won't impact your workflows and it really shouldn't affect anything you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis if you're uploading or doing any of the materials. We're not switching from content DM. We're not doing anything on that side of things. This is purely just the front end of the website. So the, all the pages that you get to before you start browsing or viewing items. Okay, so um, the next thing that we, this is something we actually have accomplished. We have a formal collection development policy on the New York Heritage website now. Um, this document gives uh, some guidance on the scope of what we intend New York Heritage to include and some of the things we are saying we don't want to include in New York Heritage. Um, most of this would be stuff you already know if you've been participating in New York Heritage. Um, but it's helpful as a way to um, bring new people on or if there's materials that are clearly not appropriate, we can point to this document and say, this is why we don't want your collection of antique shoes or something. Oh, that's a bad example. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, this is posted on our website. I will also incidentally be sharing the slides to this presentation after the fact. 
So there's a lot of links th throughout. Um, don't feel like you have to write them all down or anything. I'll make sure you have access to them. Um, but you know, scrolling through this, you can see um, has some stuff about copyright, file formats. But really, the the meat of it is in this top section when we talk about content scope. So like, what what is appropriate for inclusion in New York Heritage? This this could be helpful though, as as you're like brainstorming projects, say for a grant or otherwise, you can look at this and say, how how well am I um, filling this this uh, these these this guidance? Um, so that's something we we uh, were able to accomplish over the last year. Um, we are hoping to do more to promote. Um, a more diversified and inclusive um, collection of materials as well. So like any, like most archives, um, our, rep our representation is pretty um, limited to the people who are, were captured by historians and, and archives. So um, it'd be great to be proactively looking for better um, representation amongst our collections. So that's something that, you know, we still have yet to, to make real real inroads on. Exhibits. Um, so this is kind of a weird topic to bring up because many of you are either, if you're a public library, you might be just opening up with limited hours or limited availability of patrons to come in. Um, but we still have the physical uh, exhibits available to rent or to, to not rent, um, to borrow from us. Um, basically, if you are ready to have them back again, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, there are these two links, uh, which again, I'm gonna send out the slides, which you can click on to fill out a form to request the exhibit. Um, <laughs> I need to update my dates a little bit, so maybe I'll do that soon. Um, but uh, this will allow you to up, you know, request the exhibit if, you, if it makes sense for you to have a, a physical exhibit in your library or um, institution space. Uh, so this might have been an update last year. I think, in fact, I think it probably was. Um, we're still working on our immigration exhibit. It's been a slow process. Um, we're making inroads on the content and you know, meeting every couple of weeks now to try to finish that up. But pretty soon we'll have a third exhibit available um, to borrow physically and we'll also have um, the exhibit up online on New York Heritage and our exhibit platform. Speaking of our exhibit platform, um, we're not really set up for it much yet, but especially with the new website, one of my goals for the new website is to make it uh, feasible and easier for members such as all of you to submit your own exhibits to the platform. Um, we have a few beyond uh, those that were produced by the councils directly, but um, how come I can't scroll? That's weird. Uh, there it is. Um, so we have a few exhibits up here, but um, in the future, we're hoping to solicit exhibits from all of you. So if you have a um, collection of materials that you want um, presented in, in, in this platform, you know, reach out, we can talk. Um, and figure out whether it'd be appropriate. All right, um, and again, please type a question in the comments if you have any. Um, I'm, I'm trying to go through quickly, but I'm probably I'm missing some people and stuff here. Normally, if we were in person, I would have the visual cues of like, you don't seem like you understand what I'm saying. So um, please stop me. Uh, marking materials, this was a big topic at our last um, user group meeting. So we had a whole, um, it wasn't really a workshop, it was more of a conversation about how we could better promote and make it possible for you all to market your materials and for New York Heritage to do a better job of marking them on your behalf. Um, we made some inroads on this, uh, maybe not quite what I envisioned, but it's better than nothing. We finally did update the website um, to include uh, the graphics and some of the style guides for, for our logos. And you know, we encourage everybody to link to New York Heritage 
from their library or institution's websites. Um, that seems like a given, but I, you know, you know, more of a informal survey of, of all of your websites. It seems that it's fairly uncommon for the link to New York Heritage to be that be there or to be prominent enough that somebody would even find it. Um, so it'd be great to see more folks uh, linking uh, to New York Heritage. You spend all your all this time and effort, and in some cases, money or staff time to put these materials up. It'd be great to to see. Um, you you know directing your patrons or directing your 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 users to um, to all that hard work. Um, if you have any questions about how to use any of these or need help with how you might integrate it with your website um, beyond your IT staff, if you have it, um, please reach out. I'd be happy to help. The switching back and forth between slides and clicking on links is a little awkward. Um, another update on, on this front, we, I worked through the um, process of applying for Google ad grants. So Google ads are um, something you've all seen, whether you've really paid attention to them or not. Anytime you do a Google search, you'll see um, the first few results are ads. Um, they'll have a little ad icon. Um, the Google ads are all over the web, but that's the spot where we have available to us um, through this grant program. Um, basically, we get ten thousand dollars per month in credits. To um, you know, we can we can make an ad copy and um, submit it, and if somebody searches for the right keywords or um, are in the right geographic um, area. They'll, they'll see an ad for whatever you're trying to promote. So if you have a new collection or if you have something New York Heritage related that you'd like to promote, um, I'd be happy to field um, requests for ads from any of you. Um, I've included this Google form link. And basically what this is, is it um, goes through all the fields that are asked of me when I'm creating an ad in the Google Ads platform. And there's an example here of what, where everything is. Um, and um, basically if you fill this out, um, I would probably have a conversation with you before I did it, but I, I can put up an ad to promote something related to your um, New York Heritage materials. I've opened this to all my colleagues across the state, but I haven't had a lot of responses. So um, we are definitely not using all of our ad credits per month. So more ads would hopefully help us do that. Um, this is a whole world, that's a whole webinar on, in and of itself of what makes a good Google ad and how to promote di you know, digital collections this way. But um, you know, if you have more questions, I'd be happy to, to field those um, at another time as well. Uh, and also um, shout out to Ryan Hughes. Uh, he has been working diligently on piloting um, a New York heritage presence in, on Instagram um, while Looking at our statistics, which I'll show you guys later on, um, most of our traffic comes from Facebook. Instagram is a great platform for um, for the visual media that we have in our collections. Uh, I can't, of course, click on any of this stuff as I realized earlier because I'm not logged in on my work account. But um, you, you know, if you're on Instagram or your institution's on Instagram, I encourage you to um, follow um, the account. Um, Ryan's been doing a great job of uh, selecting images. Here's one from our, our region. This is from New Woodstock's collection. Uh, but yeah, he, he's, and actually this might be a, one of ours too. But he's, uh, he's doing a great job. Um, we're looking to ways to um, kind of expand the, the reach of this. While it's not necessarily driving a lot of traffic, it's again, getting our outreach um, out there um, so to speak, and helping to uh, reach audiences in different places. Okay, this is a slide that I literally copied without changing at all from last year, but um, I want to remind folks that we have a user, like a member forum for New York Heritage. So this is a 
statewide um, space for all of you to ask questions of your peers and all the council liaisons around there as well, all, of, all myself and all of my colleagues. So, you know, we haven't had a ton of traction on this. I was, I was hoping for a better response, but um, I encourage everybody to, to, to sign up if, they, if you haven't already. Um, it's a good place. I, I'm, I was trying to build like a community of practice and a, a place for us to ask each other questions like, for instance, um, I'm hoping to do an oral history project. What microphone should I use? Or, or has anybody experienced um, getting copyright for artistic works? Um, you know, questions that um, might benefit from a statewide uh, set of people to weigh in. So um, I still have hopes for this platform. So, uh, you know, I, again, I encourage all of you to sign up. If you sign up, I sh I'll get a notification and I'll approve you. Um, it's not publicly available. It's it's um, restricted to who the people who sign up because I want to uh, make sure we have we have, we're free to have conversations about copyright that might be, um, you know, we, we might not want to air that laundry in public in some cases. All right, moving on. Uh, so this is. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was able to accomplish early on in the pandemic, um, actually this one, this one might have been, this was pre-pandemic, but either way, this is um, a report that I built from our Google Analytics data. So all the data that is generated from our traffic to the website. Um, this, there's, there's two reports, this one and then the one on the next slide. This is the statewide traffic report. So this shows general statistics for the entire site um, so this is really helpful if you want to understand better who the demographics are from your heritage and how our users are accessing the site. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. This um, report, incidentally, is um, represents live data. So this is data that um, is up to the moment, essentially. I mean, it might be a slight delay, um, but uh, there's no manual work that I'm doing where I'm I'm updating this. This is pulling, um, it's automatically set to do the, the, the previous month of data. But if we just kind of go um, to look at more of a, a longer date range, we can go to last year and this will give us all 2019, how much, how much traffic we've had statewide. And, and again, some of that information about what, um, about our users. So pretty impressive, four, four and a half, over four and a half million um, page views. Um, Disclaimer about page views really quickly. A page view exists every time somebody hits refresh or pages through an object. So if somebody is reading or browsing through a yearbook and they're going page by page through a 200 page yearbook, they're gonna rack up 200 page views. Um, so that number, uh, all these numbers in fact, should be taken with a grain of salt, um, but this number especially. Um, the really interesting thing is the number of sessions and the number of users. So sessions is every, every it's like the full visit. So if you go and, and click on 200 pages of a yearbook, that's one session if you're only on like one, one time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's pretty impressive. We, we've had a, a good jump. Actually, the, the increases are even better for 2020. Um, but uh, we're, we're growing year over year. and most areas. Um, I'm not going to go through all this in great detail. You guys are all welcome to look at this. The nice thing about this is it's, um, you can print this out, you can hit print and you can print it out and take it to a, a meeting or whatever. But you can also, um, if you're looking at it online, you can interact with the map. So um, you can see like this, this map is not nearly as interesting um, when you print it out, but if you mouse over it, you can see, okay, for Syracuse metropolitan area, um, we've had, we had 24,000 views, but that doesn't tell the full story. If, if you're, um, I'm going to pick on Diane. So if you're a town of Madison historian and you have materials in there um, that are, you know, relating to somebody or, or um, of interest to somebody in California, you know, some of these sessions might be for your materials. It's, you know, this is the, the broad thing. You can't really, um, 
there's only so many uh, you know direct conclusions you can draw from this other than whatever um, wherever this is nobody nobody goes on the air carriage from there um, but yeah anyway um, this is also uh, you know shows new users versus returning this um, chart has been really interesting over the last um, few months so we've we've seen a lot more um, mobile views to our website during the pandemic for instance um, and yeah, again, this is a whole thing in and of itself. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if you ever, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask. I'm not an expert in Google Analytics by any stretch of the imagination, but I've spent enough time dabbling with it over the last year or so that um, I can answer basic questions at least. Okay, so that's the statewide traffic report. The next, tra the next traffic report um, might be of greater interest to many of you, um, with those of you who already have materials in your heritage. This shows um, the individual institutions uh, traffic. So, um, and it shows three types of traffic. So your institution landing pages, your collection landing pages, and the content, D content DM item views, or like if you're browsing or doing anything in content DM, those, those page views all end up there. Um, this report was a little more complicated to build because we had to enhance the data from Google Analytics. We had to basically group it in a way where all of your pages all show up under one roof. So um, to pick on Maya this time, um, if you're on video apparently, I'm gonna call, you know, use you as examples. So Maya, you might see, um, actually I'll show you what you see. Um, so this link uh, will take, it takes a minute, but um, this, so this, this one is uh, dependent on me uploading the data into a spreadsheet. So um, while the other one is, can be up to the minute, this one, uh, for instance, only has through July so far because I just got last night or yesterday, the, the page view spreadsheet for last month. So I have to, probably tomorrow, I'll, I'll go through and I'll add that, that data. Um, but you can go through and um, drill down through this um, data and see your institution. So we'll, we'll pick on Maya. So if I search for her, the name of her institution and hit only, and this will show just Fayetteville. It won't show anybody else's. Um, and this is for, um, to be clear, especially because this is manual, this is, we started collecting this data in January. So we have from January on. It's a little weird if you're trying to do um, fiscal year, if your fiscal year is July to June, if you're trying to get statistics for that, um, you might still need to reach out to me for that, but, um, Looking at just 2020 so far, you can get your um, your page view. So reading this, um, Fayetteville has had just under 3,000 page views through the end of July. Um, of those, 83 were to their landing page directly, their institution landing page, and a total of 91 were to each of their three landing pages. And then um, the the content DM, this is when they're actually browsing and viewing um, objects that are uploaded to New York Heritage. So as you'll notice, um, we do spend a, uh, some time putting together these landing pages, but the, the page views dwarf in comparison to the um, page views for your, um, for your institution, or sorry, for, for content DM. And part of the reason for this is not everybody is going through um, and seeing those, those um, landing pages. If you go to New York Heritage and you search here, you're bypassing all of that. If you type in, um, see if this works, I don't know. If you type in, um, you know, something that shows, uh, no, not here. that would've been too convenient. Um, if you were, um, you know, searching for something and I'm in Google and, and the results show up, um, you might bypass a lot of our pages and go directly to women of Fayetteville items or a specific object of like 
for portrait of Matilda Jocelyn Gage or something. Um, so yeah, the other thing that um, I'm, I'm gonna spend another minute on this and I'm gonna, I promise I'll move on. Uh, I'm gonna do, ball, I'm gonna pick on ball as well. Uh, as I said before with the yearbooks, um, yearbook page views um, can greatly inflate these numbers. Uh, because every time somebody clicks through a page, they're um, getting another, they're racking up another page view. So Baldwinsville um, has a you know pretty impressively high number of page views, but I would attribute most of that not only do they have a lot of objects in in their collections, but they also have um, a whole yearbook collection, which is seen as we can see here um, a fair amount of traffic. So um, my guess is that a good portion of those page views are people, pay, you know, who um, are paging through their books and, and, you know, racking them up there. So again, keep, take these numbers with a grain of salt. Um, one other thing I'm going to point out about this before I move on, because um, it's kind of cool. Uh, if you want to share a view, any view of this report with um, other stakeholders, so your board, your director, your anybody, you can copy this URL and, and share the URL and that URL will take whoever you send it to directly to this view. Um, so that's really useful if you want to, you know, share it with somebody, um, but not like print it or take a, take, take a PDF because you can, I believe, you can download it. Um, but that's, again, you're going to have a static, you won't be able to interact with it at all. Um, so I, I recommend that, especially if you um, want to want to share it with um, other stakeholders, you can copy and paste this URL and they'll see exactly what you see here. Um, instead of having to explain like, oh, you click here and you click here and you click here. Um, so I recommend doing that. And I really apologize. I should have shared this with you guys a long time ago. I get kind of caught up in moving forward with everything. And I, didn't quite get to share that um, with you until now, but I'll make sure that I share it with everybody who's also not on this call. Um, I'm gonna pause before going to New York State Historic Newspapers and just ask, are there any questions about anything New York Heritage related before I move on? Uh, I know I've been talking really fast, uh, but if you have any questions, type them in. I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee and uh, move on if I don't see anything. wish they would tell me if, if somebody was, was chatting because that, that's helpful on other platforms. Zoom's changing their, their settings every every day it feels like so maybe they'll add that. But so I don't know if people are typing um, but I'm not seeing any questions so I'm gonna assume that I'm covering everything to an extent that people don't have questions which is awesome. You can also of course email me after the fact if you have questions um, I'd be happy to um, answer them after the fact. So um, New York Heritage is, is what I spend a lot of my time on. Um, but we have, as a region, been starting to revamp or, or um, renew our contributions and, and our output to New York State Historic Newspapers. New York State Historic Newspapers is similar to New York Heritage. It's a free access um, newspaper repository. So. Um, a while back, we took all the newspapers or all the full newspapers, not clippings necessarily, but all the full newspapers out of New York Heritage and put it in a new repository, um, which is built to better handle the huge amounts of pages and text that um, come with newspapers. Um, new York State Historic Newspapers is built on the Library of Congress's Cron-Am or Chronically America um, platform, and it's much better suited to handling newspaper content than, than um, content DM is. Uh, so because all the newspapers have been um, run through optical character recognition, they are searchable, keyword searchable. Um, and uh, so if you, you can look up somebody's name and hopefully find, find them. Uh, we have a number of contributors from CRC's region. Um, and you participate by uh, clearing the copyright 
uh, for the newspapers with the publisher if the materials are still in copyright. So newspapers are um, considered published. So anything before 1925, you really need to have permission from the publisher or whoever bought the publisher, bought the rights to the publication. Um, this is really important because we want to be uh, uh, following all, you know, same with New York Heritage, we want to be following and, and uh, respecting copyright restrictions. Uh, New York, so th this, this, this whole program is run out of the Northern New York Library Network. So our um, organization to the North and they do a lot of digitization from microfilm as well. So uh, one of the ways you can participate is by applying for a grant, which I'm gonna to touch on a little bit later and apply for a grant through CRC and send your, your microfilm up to Northern New York. And they will digitize it and put it in their repository and send you back the reels. And uh, there, is a, there is a cost associated with that. So that's why I often recommend folks um, apply for grants. Uh, so I'll pick on Rebecca this time. Rebecca Hewitt at SUNY Poly uh, is in year one of what will probably be a multi-year project to digitize several uh, newspapers. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Hi from the Cirque desk. Um, so they're, they're in the midst of a, probably a several year um, project, ongoing um, grant project to digitize several o Oneida area um, and Utica area newspapers. So four to five, yeah, I, I, I agree with that assessment. Um, so you're our current poster child for New York Heritage, uh, or sorry, uh, New York State Historic Newspapers submissions. Um, but we'd love to see more of these from other organizations. Uh, basically anything that isn't already up there or isn't otherwise available. Some, sometimes uh, materials are available in, um, you know, other repositories like uh, Fulton History is a very common one, uh, but they might not be at as high of resolution or, you know, there's other, other um, reasons why having it only there might be fraught. Um, so, you know, basically reach out if you, if you think you have materials that you'd like to um, contribute and we can work it out. So by way of a quick update for the newspaper project, they are very um, steadily adding new, new pages. Um, they're currently at, at over 10 and a half million pages of newspapers from every county in New York State. Um, they did pause scanning for a little while, um, understandably with the pandemic, um, but they are back up and running, at least on a, on a limited basis. Uh, they do recommend though that you contact them at digitization at nnylm.org um, to ensure that if you ship them film, that they're there to accept it and um, they uh, are ready for it. Another thing to mention that, uh, you know, to call, to call out Maya again, um, it is also possible, um, and Fayetteville had some of these materials done, that you have uh, digital files. So you've gone, gone through another um, vendor to digitize your newspapers. And if you make the digital files available to us, we can put them up there as well. It doesn't hurt to put, you know, your digital files that you paid or have had, had grant funded to, um, to produce um, up in multiple places. More, more places, the more people see them, everybody's happy. Um, so it's not just film or physical newspapers, but um, also digital files are welcome as well. Sometimes there's a little bit of a complication if it, depending on the vendor, whether the pages are in a format and an arrangement that, you know, they can go right up. Sometimes there's a little more massaging, but um, definitely it's uh, a possibility. Uh, one thing that I don't know if I shared with you all before, but they have this great, and I'm envious of it, uh, project tracker. So you can actually see what they have in their queue. Um, so for instance, SUNY Poly, uh, they are currently OCRing um, the last submission of their materials. Um, and perhaps most importantly, the, the most important takeaway from this is they aren't really scanning a lot right now. They have this one that they've been you know, sitting on for five years now, but basically now's the time to send them uh, film uh, if you have gotten a grant from us to do so or um, 
just have something lying around you want it done now's the time to talk to them because they don't usually have a lot longer queue of materials right waiting to be digitized now a lot of it's in processing but this is even shorter than it was as well so they're, they're, they're catching up Yeah, and thank you, Rebecca, for specifying. Um, yeah, yeah, she's done a great job of adding Utica papers, especially like a, a city the size of Utica should be represented in a, in a repository like this. So we're really appreciative to them for making those materials available. All right, so I don't have too much to say about New York State historic newspapers. They they have a lot going on, and kind of chugging along. Uh, so this is something that we've um, been working on for a little while. CRC has um, what we call the DigLab. I know it's, it looks like DigLab, so it's a little confusing name, unfortunately. But um, the DigLab is where we um, are capable of doing some in-house digitization. Uh, there are certain materials that we would feel uncomfortable doing or um, we don't have the equipment to do. But for a lot of um, monographs, so like yearbooks, books in general, um, photographs we can do, newspapers, as long as, you know, physical newspapers we're talking about, um, as long as they're not too large. Um, we, we're doing, uh, currently digitizing a, a couple of um, physical papers um, right, right on the other side of that wall. Um, so, this is uh, really helpful, I think, on uh, the way we designed this was to make it easier for folks to contribute when they get a grant. Um, a grant, as many of you probably know, is a double-edged sword. You have money, but you then have to spend the money and you have to spend it within a certain amount of time. And you also have to manage the staff, you have to hire staff, you have to do all that. Um, my goal with the Dig Lab was to take a lot of that off your plates. So, um, not only do we do the digitization work um, for uh, projects that we do, we also handle the metadata to an extent, sometimes we need some input, and we do the upload to New York Heritage. So basically, if you apply for a grant through CRC, you can have our material, we can, we, you can you basically give us the materials, give us some context, maybe help a little bit with metadata if you have some photographs or something that's, you know, we need your expertise for, um, and then we do all the rest. So, you know, you get the money and the output without all the, the headache. That's my, uh, you know, pitch anyway. Um, another thing that we're adding now um, that we've added to our, our workflow for this year is making all the, the materials that we're digitizing, putting them in the digital dark archive. I'm gonna talk about this later, so I'm not gonna go too much into what that means, but that's um, a, a, something that's new about this. Uh, for this year is that every everything is going in there um, as we're digitizing it, which is making it a little more efficient um, and uh, very, very helpful. Um, so this this Dig Lab, or the service, we're mostly tackling grant projects. Um, in fact, we're, we're still working on 2019 projects. Um, but if you have uh, projects that weren't grant funded, especially if they're smaller and you can just afford them yourself or there's a rush or there's various reasons why you might do this we can also handle uh you know projects that are not grant funded so um, we're doing we're working out uh, a project right now with esf for instance um a monograph a couple of monographs that they're going to have us digitize um so our goal with this is not to they're currently um i know our, my my uh, CRC's executive director is on as well, um, Mark Mark Wildman. So I don't want to make promises that um, Mark or I will have to back off on in the future. But currently, we're not trying to make money off of this. Um, this isn't a revenue stream; it's a service for our members. So really, our our rates and our our process is designed to break even. Obviously, that's kind of a little little um, weird sometimes from an accounting standpoint because we're giving you the grant money and then we're breaking even from that grant money. So it's our money, I don't know. Anyway, um, so the the benefit here is that we're not, um, we're able to do projects um, much less expensively than, than a vendor that's, you know, for profit. Um, and not say that we're, we're 
incomparable in every way to a vendor. Um, our equipment is limited. Um, I feel our expertise is well suited to simpler projects. If you have something that's really complicated or audiovisual or anything that's more complicated or needs a higher resolution scanning, then you're probably still better off going with a vendor. But you know, we're, we're here for, for basic stuff. Done a ton of yearbooks. Um, but if you're interested at all, you can email me for a quote. Um, and this is especially important for grant funded projects because um, I want to make sure I have the quote so you can uh, write your grant and know how much you're asking for. Okay, so I um, mentioned a couple of these things already, but just to give you a sense of how much scanning we're doing. Um, so beginning in May, we began work on 2019 grant projects in May of 2019. And since then we've, we've logged over or right around uh, 1250 hours. Um, we had two project assistants working for a while. Now we're, we're, we have one who's working more hours. Um, Ashley has been with us um, since May of last year. She's doing a great job. Um, and she's been very, very thorough and, and uh, you know, diligently working away on, on scanning and creating the metadata for, for these projects. She took a pause um, and maybe did a few things from home, but uh, really took a pause during the early days of the pandemic. But um, she's now back for the time being and working uh, away on stuff. So we're, we're finishing up the last two of the 2019 digitization projects before we start the 2020 projects. So uh, many of you on the call might have been recipients of a 2020 project and we will get to it soon, hopefully. Um, we're trying our best to get those last two projects wrapped up so we can not get too much further behind. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we're, we can do work for hire as well. Um, so, you know, we'd uh, be happy to do that um, if, you're, if you're interested. Um, I see Charlene's going. Um, if you're still on, see you later. Again, feel free, I, no, no hard feelings if you guys have everything that's going on. Right, this is a long day. Um, okay, so this is these are just a couple of shots of our book scanners. We also have flatbed scanners. Uh, the one on the left is our newer one that we've had um, since the beginning of last year. Um, as you can see, it has a cradle and um, it's a little bit better at doing monographs. Um, the kick scanner is our first book scanner that uh, we still occasionally use for monographs, but a lot of it's, this is what we're doing our, our um, newspaper digitization. It's better for flat materials, um, but it's nice we have both, both um, setups and uh, we're able to accommodate a greater variety of projects for that reason. Okay, moving right along. Um, we're, we're, wrap, we're gonna be wrapping up this platform overview and update sooner than later. Um, and then we'll do a 10 minute break. Uh, so Empire Archival Discovery Cooperative. Um, this is our statewide repository for finding aids. Finding aids are um, the guides to what's in a physical collection held by an archive. So there are, as with anything in the archives and library world, um, a series of standards and recommendations. Um, this one, in this case, it's known as Describing Archives a Content Standard or DACs. Um, and there's a whole community of practice around, around this. But really what it boils, boils down to is these are, um, you know, some contextual information about an archival collection. And then oftentimes, but not always, it'll also include um, an inventory, a box and folder, or um, a series level intellectual list of what is in the, in the collection. Um, so there, there, there could be, and I think we have a few examples of this, where a finding aid also describes materials that, or collections that may have some materials available in New York Heritage. This is um, in a lot of ways a separate, um, you know, concern entirely. Most archives won't, um, for, for staff, staffing reasons and other, um, have the capacity to digitize all their materials. So having a finding aid will allow you to describe for a researcher who might visit your institution physically um, what materials you have and whether they 
might be able to do research on a, on a given topic at your institution. Um, so Ember ADC fills a, several purposes. Um, it is a repository of finding aids, um, which is what the end user or the, the person, you know, if you go to empireadc.org, you'll, you'll be able to browse through the finding aids. Also from all of your perspectives, um, it allows you to create EAD finding aids. So EAD is encoded archival discover, or sorry, encoded ar archival description. Uh, so this is one of those standards. It's an XML container for, for organizing that, um, the finding aid in a, it's almost, like it's, it's an XML, it's, which is um, for those of you not familiar with XML, XML is similar to HTML. It's a coded um, way of, of organizing data. Um, so Empire ADC will allow you to create um, EAD finding aids, which are the standards that are most widely accepted. Um, it also stores those finding aids. You can pull the finding aids out. So you can pull the EAD out. You can put it the EAD on your own website or wherever else you want. Um, so it, it kind of fills several purposes in addition to just being that like place for researchers to look for, for um, guides. This project is managed by the Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. Um, so it's in Valley region, essentially. And uh, I, I sit on their advisory um, committee so, and I've been involved in it for a number of years, but um, Jen Palmentero and, um, you know, is, is more the, the authority for, um, you know, working on the particulars of this. Uh, and if you are interested, I can, I can certainly help you get started, but bringing us to the update, um, there's several caveats there. Um, the editor, which is that platform for creating the EAD finding aids, um it, it has problems <laughs> it's it's having trouble um it's there are kind of compounding errors and and things that are broken and it came to a point where uh there was a kind of a shake up in, in, the, in the development team for the project and we didn't we don't have a good way of fixing it in its current form um, so as a result, um, Southeastern is working with the Metropolitan um, Resources Council, Library Resources Council in New York City um, to develop a new form tool, a new tool for creating that, those EAD finding aids in their, in Metro's um, new platform, Archipelago. So basically this is a new way, you, the old editor was a form tool, so you, you weren't coding XML, you weren't, um, you're, you're filling out a, a form on a website, essentially. And this will replace that eventually. They're, they're making great strides, honestly. Like I, the, the demos I've seen are very promising. Um, there's more of an active development in Archipelago versus the editor, which was kind of uh, one person's passion project. Uh, so going forward, I think the um, editing and creation of, of finding aids are gonna be a lot easier in the new platform. That being said, the editor still works for the most part and uh, existing users can still use it. Um, I would be a little hesitant um, to train new people on how to use it um, because of those issues I, I mentioned earlier. Um, but if you have a pressing need to do something, I would certainly you know, get you started up on it. Hopefully in the next little while, we'll have um, the form tool, the new form tool built. Um, the other major project from this initiative is um, the process for harvesting finding aids. So um, if you're a large institution um, in our region, I would use um, Syracuse University as an example, but some of the some smaller institutions have them as well. You might have EAD finding aids on your, on your um, university's website or, or college website. Um, and we've developed a way to um, extract those finding aids, put them in a way, put them in a platform. We use GitHub where we can um, check them for changes and normalize, put them in the right format for our, our needs and our repository. So basically you can take a, a large group of existing finding aids, export them out of your system and import them into ours. Um, 
we're working on um, a more specific way of doing this out of archive space, which is a uh, tool that a lot of larger institutions will use to create and manage their finding aids. Um, so I think we, we, we've had some initial success, but it's not a full foolproof process. So if you are using archive space, which may or may not include anybody on this call currently, but if you're listening to the recording, maybe um, we're working on it, we're getting closer. Um, and they're also looking for new institutions to harvest. So um, if somebody else in our region has EAD finding aids that they'd like to contribute, uh, reach out to me and I can put you in touch with uh, the folks at SETI Lurk and we can work out a way to, to try out your harvest. Um, and finally, if that's all not enough in the last little while, they've built a new version or beta version of the front end for the website, um, which is built in a platform called ArcLight, which um, I'm not gonna get into all the, the technical uh, specifications around that, but it's a little bit more robust and um, commonly used platform than, uh, let's see, I'm gonna remember. I, I can't remember off the top of my head the, the current, um, what, what the current website is built on. It's gonna come to me in a little bit, but, um, this, this kind of gives you a sense for what the new website will look like. Um, so I'm gonna pick on the Erie Canal Museum. Um, big caveat here is if, when they exported the live version of Empire ADC into this new one, um, they weren't able to see what collections or what finding aids were published versus unpublished. So there's definitely some like practice collections in here or things that were published. So that's the big grain of salt here. Um, so, Erie Canal, I can't remember, I think I saw somebody from the Erie Canal on here. Um, if you see something that shouldn't be published, it's still not published on live, probably. It just happens to be here. Oh, there's Ashley. Cool. I know I, I, know I saw you earlier. Um, so yeah, this is the, this is the new view. Um, and it honestly, they've done a great job. It's a little bit more, actually, it's even changed since the last time I looked at it. But um, they have... Uh, it's a little bit easier to browse down through stuff uh, than it was before. Um, and they cleaned up a lot of this um, view. It's a little bit, little bit snappier, a little bit easier to browse than it was before. Um, so I think they're pretty close to launching this. I can't remember exactly where they are on this. I think I have a meeting, maybe even tomorrow, where I'm getting an update. But yeah, just, I know a few of you um, are participating in, in Empire DC, and I know at least a few of you were in some of the early, early trainings um, looking at you, Maya. Um, so, um, you know, it, we're, it's come a long way since then. And uh, it's, it's really exciting uh, to see it kind of turn into more of a real thing, whereas it's been in beta for like forever. Um, Big, big, uh, you know, asterisk here is there's a cost model that we've developed um, for charging for this as a separate service. It hasn't been implemented yet. I'm not sure when it's going to be implemented. It probably has. It will probably be coinciding with the um, launching of some of these. You know, uh, the front end and the back end being complete, and we have something to show for our work. Um, but the good news is. The way the cost model is arranged that uh, small institutions, as many of you are, would be unlikely to have any charge. Um, it's really structured to um, be a sliding scale. Um, I don't know, the, the timing of this is of course awful with a lot of people having um, budget cuts or, or at least being a little bit more cautious in how you're spending your library budget, but um, there might be some more news on that. I should have included that as a bullet, but um, that's, to be to be seen, I guess. Okay, so um, moving on uh, to our digital archive, I'm going to give a really quick, quick um, explanation and update because I'm going to spend some time after our break coming up in a few minutes going into this in much greater depth. 
But the digital archive is our long-term storage for digital files. Um, to put it like in layman's terms, it's a backup for your backup. This is like your nuclear option. If everything else is gone, something catastrophic happened and all of your local copies are gone, you go, you go to the digital archive and get your copies from there. Um, we have, it's long-term storage. It's built, built to be um, you know, archival and preserved over the long term. New York Heritage, I'm not saying it's insecure and you should like run to the hills, but it's not designed, it's not intended to be um, an archival collection. So it's all of its features, all of its architecture are designed to, for access, for making it possible for users to get to your materials. Much less important are all the considerations for digital preservation, which I'm gonna go through later, but digital archive is, is um, I think maybe a, a really important, um, a really important um, project that we've been working on for the last couple of years that probably is pretty far from most of your minds. Um, but having these backups are really important. So we have um, long-term uh, storage for all of your hard work and all of your grant money and et cetera, et cetera. So quick update. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we're submitting to the digital archive for all of the projects that we're currently digitizing through our digital lab for current projects. Um, so I often, send, you know, when the project's completely done, I'll send you an email and I'll say, here, here's, here's, everything, here's where everything is. We've um, sent it on to the digital archive. Here's the files for your local copy. Um, and it'll be the same set of files that I've sent on to the digital archive. So we're trying to kind of simplify that process and be better about getting the, you those files. That being said, hold me accountable. If you, have, if, if you know the project's over um, and it's been done in the last year and you haven't gotten that email from me, let me know, because I definitely need to go back and double check and make sure I haven't let anybody slip through the cracks. But the idea is that everybody is, is um, having the materials end up here. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll, again, I'll go more into what this all means shortly. Um, and the other thing that's worth mentioning, and again, I'm gonna talk about this more later, um, it, New York Heritage submissions are happening automatically and New York State Historic Newspapers, I guess, as well. But um, if you have other materials, so especially if you're at a larger institution and you have other digital files or other materials that you'd like to take advantage of the storage um, that we have available, then we would have a separate talk about that. And I'm gonna talk about that more later, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cannibalize the rest of my talk by, by going into that further now. Okay, so those are all the platforms. I'm gonna give like I have two more slides, I promise, and then we'll have a, a 10 minute break um, and come back and I'll, I'll do a longer talk about the digital learner archive. So um, this is literally the subject of another webinar, but I want to um, remind folks that we have access and digitization grants available through CRC for our affiliate members and above. So if you're a heritage member, you might need to upgrade to affiliate to qualify. Um, my goal is to keep my, my typical schedule for this where I open the application process in late November, um, hopefully sometime after Thanksgiving, I would say. And the deadline um, will be January 31st, 2021 for the next round of digitization projects, well, digitization metadata and retrospective conversion projects. Um, Again, I'm not gonna to go too far in depth into these. Um, you're welcome to ask me about them. If you aren't familiar with them, I'm always happy to, to talk people through potential projects. But um, for those of you who have applied in the past or um, kind of have heard my spiel enough, enough times, um, now's the time to start thinking about projects or at least have in the back of your mind. So when you're going through your your other your day to day work and you notice something that'd be really cool to put up in your State historic newspapers in New York Heritage, or you know something that needs fixing up with metadata, um, you know file it away and, and have it ready to go when when, we, when I open applications. Um, as I mentioned, I will have a webinar, um, a separate webinar on the application process, and this is actually required for people who haven't applied for these grants in the past. And I will go through the application and the, the timeline, all the details I can possibly think of. 
Um, and the goal for this is to make sure everybody going into the grant process can is is uh, set up to, to submit a successful application. I you know I don't make the decisions for these grants. I I sit on a I help on like a I work with a committee of CRCs that decides it. Um, so I I like to be think of myself as an advocate for all of you to help you guys get these grants and, and get everything settled up so you can take advantage of the money that we have available. Um, kind of on, on a side note there, um, we. Um, obviously have some, you know, the potential concerns about our budget being um, more limited this year than previous years with um, most of our money coming from the state. That being said, um, and again, I don't want to make too many promises on behalf of Mark, but um, he, he should still be on. Um, we don't anticipate um, our money available to these grants being different than, the, than it has been in the past. So um, as of right now, uh, we, we anticipate having a normal uh, amount of money available, which is usually around 40,000 um, to fund these projects. And actually the other thing here, uh, so there's a, a link to the website um, where I have um, a lot of materials, and I think even, even including my webinar from last year. So um, that's an, a good introduction if you want more information as well. Also lists all the, the last few years of grant projects that have been successful and how much they've asked for. Okay, last slide. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, um, we're limiting our, tra our travel a little bit more um, as you know, many of you probably are as well. Um, well, I have actually gone out and done um, at least one site visit in person and it's helpful if we're looking at physical materials or something that would be hard to do over Zoom. I'm also available via Zoom. So like, especially if it's something that you just have a more in-depth conversation or question, set of questions than would be able to do um, on the phone or an email. I'm mean, happy to schedule a Zoom call. Um, that was doing the audit. What? His name is John. J-O-H-N. Yeah. All right, there we go, I think it worked. Um, so yeah, let me know if you if you um, like me to do like like a site visit or a consultation. I'm happy to help out any way I can. Whew. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna say we'll do a, a ten minute uh, break. So we'll be back around uh, two twenty five ish, and um, we'll jump right into this mini. Uh, workshop on digital to our archive. So take a minute. Um, I'm going to catch my breath and drink some water and I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> All right, everybody, we'll get started again and get into the next section. Um, before I move on though, uh, are there any questions? I, I kind of jumped right into the break there and I should have um, asked that question before I uh, did so. So if there are any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself and just chime in or, um, you know, you can type them. I should have offered the unmute thing before and while I was waiting for people to type things in. All right, not hearing or seeing any questions, I'll just continue to assume that I'm making sense. <laughs> All right, but yeah, even if I moved on, please please feel free to, to chime, chime in with a question in chat. It's a little bit easier that way when I'm talking, but um, I, I do pause talking, which is, hasn't happened much yet. Um, you know, feel free to, to go on audio as well. Might, might be quicker than typing for some most people. Okay, so our next uh, feature here is uh, a kind of a mini webinar workshop on our digital dark archive. Um, and really, I'm, I'm going to present this as a, as like almost an like a really quick introduction to um, digital preservation. What that what that term means. What the concerns are. Um, I. 
will be the first to admit I am not an expert on digital preservation. My experience with it is pretty narrowly limited to the work I've done on the digital dark archive and you know not much beyond that. So um, I don't you know claim absolute authority on this. So if you hear something and it like, doesn't sound right or like want to chime in, I, I will welcome other input as well. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to start at the beginning again, like I did before, and not assume a lot of prior knowledge. Um, but if I am going too fast, still just you know shoot me shoot a question in the chat, and I will try to explain things better. So um, before we we dive into this, what is digital preservation? So I put together this quote on the left, kind of as a hodgepodge of different you know ways I've seen it defined elsewhere on the web um, and really what when it boils down to it um, digital preservation is a management system for storing and maintaining digital files to ensure long-term accessibility and usability we're going to delve into most parts of that um, through the next little bit um, and the, the curious thing about this that you might notice is how similar that sounds to traditional archiving, if you have an archival background or you know work as a librarian doing archival work, um, that you could pretty much take out that digital files with physical files or physical materials, and you'd have a roughly you know similar uh, definition for preservation in an archival sense anywhere. Um, so really, there that definition makes it sound more similar to regular archival work than it actually is, but also reminds us that a lot of the fundamentals and a lot of the goals are the same, just the mechanisms and the concerns are slightly different. Uh, so we have this, you know, I, I didn't get around to adding as many photographs or materials from, from our collections as I would have liked, but there's a wonderful um, old, old shot of uh, this man in Jewish Federation of Greater Buffalo, working in settings that like not that different from what a lot of archives look like today. So, again, I want to I want to kind of um, straddle that divide between saying digital preservation is completely different and it's completely the same because it's in a lot of sen senses it's different and the same. So, a lot of these challenges are going to be where we where we show the differences. Um, so, uh, these. This is, this is a you know definitely not a complete list, but maybe uh, list the top reasons why it can be challenging to handle digital preservation. The first is maybe the most obvious, and most most people would think of this um, just in managing their own digital files on their hard drives and their their own materials. Um, misplacing something, so you know having a, like what, which thumb drive was this on, or like yeah, I think I lost that that DVD from ten years ago with the, with those documents. Or um, you know, this is like a backup issue for you know that, that's very common in office settings, but just accidentally deleting files, not realizing it until after the fact that they're gone. So um, this is a little bit different than a physical um, archives because while well, you could theoretically misplace objects, um, deleting them is not usually as simple as you know a couple of clicks. It's usually has to be more deliberate. So you're less likely to have things just poof and disappear in person than you would in, in a digital setting. Um, but you know, th that's th that first item should be pretty, pretty straightforward. The next one's kind of weird. It's it's something known as bit rot. So um, this is a phenomenon from that is experienced by data that is particularly old. So um, most of our data is, you know, the average lifespan of a laptop or a PC is only a few years. And, um, you know, when was the last time you, you pulled that DVD or that CD from 10 years ago that you backed up all that stuff? So BitRot is not something we encounter very much in our everyday lives, but essentially what this is, is the gradual decay of data over time. So um, I'm trying to think of a good an analogy for this, but, Essentially, this is like, you know, kind of similar in a, in a physical sense to like water damage or, or uh, fading of newspaper where um, over time, uh, the bits, the ones and zeros will, will get a little confused. So, you know, the magnetic media um, might 
be be demagnetized or or um, that's a little more drastic than it usually is. It's often just like a, a distortion of the file over time. Um, and this isn't something that can be planned for very well, but there's ways to get to, to manage it as we'll get into later. Um, the next couple are pretty, pretty, uh, you know, you probably all experience this in some form or another, obs obsolete storage media. So easiest example of this is, is a floppy disk. So my daughter is four years old. If I showed her a floppy disk, she'd have no idea what it, you know, or even a 10 year old these days, you know, they have no idea what a floppy disk is because they never used it. Um, and if you, if, even for all of you who know what a floppy disk is, if you were handed one, you'd be like, how do I get the, to the data in here? Um, you would have to find, I, somewhere I have a USB um, floppy disk drive for the three and a half ones. Um, so in theory, I could, you know, access that, but that, that's, a, you can see where that could get worse over time as we get further away from um, storage media being commonly used. Same thing's going to happen with DVDs. Same thing's going to happen with, you know, um, even some of our hard drives and stuff down the line. So um, this this brings up a really interesting point with um, digital preservation that is not, there's no analog for in physical um, preservation. It's not a set thing. You don't just save something to a, to a, a location and, it, okay, we're good, we're done, walk away. It's um, it's always a process. You always have to be transferring your materials to the next storage media, so that you um, don't aren't stuck with a pile of floppy disks where 30 years, 20, well, 25, 30 years ago, that was the best way to store store data. But now it's useless. You don't want to be stuck in that. So you would have probably transferred to CDs and your CDs to flash drives. Your flash drives hopefully to something more um, central, like a um, larger hard drive or something. So I mean, you, you probably do this anyway, but this is something that's really important. Obsolete software. So this is something that um, you may or may not have experienced, but um, if you have a software ap application, for instance, that um, ran in DOS, um, you would have to um, you know, use an emulator or like a, a program to, to open that program within the Windows environment or within an iOS environment, um, or not iOS, um, Mac OS. But, um, you know, you can see over time where that's an issue. Um, and combining both of these uh, is um, a good example is video games. Um, so if you have an Atari cartridge, how do you access that? The software and the, and the physical media are, are hard to access at this point because most people don't have an Atari console or a super regular Nintendo sitting around and can, can plug it in and play it. So you can kind of see where this, this could happen over time. Um, and then this last point, um, you know, copyright affects everything in, in digital preservation, everything in, in all the work that we do. But um, copyrighted and, and proprietary formats are, are an issue as well. So if you had um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. So if you had like a Photoshop file and 20, 30 years ago from now, nobody uses Photoshop, that file might not be able to be opened because it's in a proprietary format. It's in a specific format that's, that's no longer used. Um, or the emulation, the, the production of that environment is, is limited by copyright. So if Adobe decides they don't want anybody to access PDFs anymore, well, PDFs are, are more broadly used, but like, you know, there's definitely proprietary formats that would be really hard to access if the copyright holders of the software producers decide that they don't want to make them available. So these are all challenges that like, you know, mostly don't have good analogies for regular preservation. So um, this, the Digital Dark Archive does not claim to solve all these problems. There's a lot of other things that need to happen to um, address a lot of those issues, but at least from a storage and file maintenance standpoint, um, we the digital archive and the tools that it comprises are um, really designed to have more peace of mind and better prepare your data for long-term storage. Um, so, as a dark archive, the digital archive. It's not accessible. So the term dark archive basically just means that 
Um, it's like closed stacks in a library. It's not, not everybody can go in and, and access your files there. So this is where um, seeing it as a counterpoint to New York Heritage is really a, a good way of looking at it. New York Heritage is your storefront. That's, that's your, where everything is, is um, out there for the world to access. Digital archive is more like your, your lock, lock box in your back, back office. It's not, you know, you're not inviting everybody into your lockbox. You're, you know, going into it when you need it, but it's not really accessible. So access to the digital dark archive is limited to council staff and um, it's built and managed by Southeastern again. Um, so they have, they're the ones that um, basically um, facilitate access to this data. Um, so, you know, it's not publicly accessible in the same way New York Heritage is or other other stuff. So um, one of the one of the ways we, one of the things we worked out with Southeastern is that all materials that are currently in New York Heritage are eligible to go into the digital archive through um, kind of an umbrella CLRC account, and they're charging us for that account and the storage. They're not we're, we're not passing that charge on to each, each one of you individually. So basically anything that's in New York Heritage is eligible to be added to the digital archive at no cost to you. Um, yeah, that, that being said, there's other, other reasons to limit no, that, that might be limited, but in theory, everything's, everything's eligible. Um, at this point, uh, we're really focusing on accepting TIFF, JPEG, JPEG 2000, PDF, MP3, and WAV files. This gets back to that point from the previous slide about um, proprietary formats. So we don't want um, Adobe Illustrator files. We don't want even Word documents. We want the PDF because PDF is, is shown to be, or it's been accepted by the archival community to be the archival copy of that data. Um, so the resources in the future will be ded more dedicated to being able to access PDFs several decades from now, whereas Word documents are more unstable and, and more um, less likely to be able to be accessed. Um, so CRC piloted our first contribution to the digital archive back in 2018. And finally, here in 2020, we're like, you know, up and running and we're regularly making contributions. Um, and I'm going to go through the, our workflow in, in a couple slides. But uh, Across the board, though, we're a little bit, we're more at the forefront. So there's a couple of the other councils. Um, so if Ryan Hughes is still on, you know, he's he's playing around with it for his members. Um, Claire Level for South Central is also looking at it for her members. And, and you know, we're trying to work through together. Because uh, one of the interesting things about all this is it's simultaneously daunting because you want to do it right. And simultaneously, at the same time, like, you know, more simple than it seems at first. Once you do it a few times, it's actually not that difficult. It's just, you don't want to do it wrong. You want to be uh, responsible and, and proactive stewards of this data for long-term storage. So um, this, this is, uh, you know, I'm definitely going to share the slides. I'm going to go through this quickly, but, you know, this might be a helpful way of comparing um, a digital archive with you know, your traditional file backups. So your, your, what you're probably hopefully already doing in terms of your local backups. Um, so there's basically, a, there's a correlation between the rows of the, of the this outside of the Venn diagram. So the digital archive is, it takes a little while to get your data back. Whereas if you have a traditional file backup, you might just need to find that hard drive in your drawer or whatever and plug it in. It might be, a, theory is a lot faster. Um, Digital Archive is, has offsite file um, cloud storage, whereas um, your traditional file, file backup is more likely to be um, you know, held locally, hopefully not local locally. Like, you know, it's helpful to have your extra copies in multiple different locations and not just in the drawer of your desk where you know, if, if something were to happen to your building or um, your premise that you, know, you lose your primary and your backup copies in the same hypothetical, I hate to say it, fire, um, you know, or other natural, natural disaster, flood. Um, so yeah, there, 
hopefully you, you have you have an offsite copy as well. Um, so again, the digital archive is not publicly accessible, whereas your file backup or your um, local copies, you might have a copy on your website or you might have um, uh, it on a shared drive if your institution has like a um, network drive or something like that. Um, the other thing that's important, the next thing that's important is um, preservation metadata. So part of submitting these packages, which I'm going to get into uh, subsequent slides, we're, we're describing what we're, what we're putting together. We're, we're um, think about it like in a physical collection, if you're writing on the outside of the box, we're, we're doing that right, writing on the outside of the box. Um, whereas, um, um, whereas, you know, if you're have your backup, you might have it on a hard drive, but it's just a folder. You're not describing it for yourself. So, if 20 years from now somebody happens across that folder, they might not know what they're looking at. Whereas hopefully we're building it in a way that, um, you know, you're, somebody down the road will have all the information they need to understand what they're looking at. Rebecca had a question via chat. Um, yes, I will, I will uh, go a little bit more into the preferred format for archival um, documents. PDFs are considered the, um, the best format in my understanding for, for documents. Um, and I encourage you to, you know, if you're, if you're looking into this to do some of your own research as well, I don't wanna, again, I'm, I'm only an authority up to a certain point on this, um, but my understanding is that PDFs are the agreed to Mahan format in much the way that TIFFs are for images. So TIFFs and JPEGs are both being stored by the Digital Dark Archive, but the TIFF is uncompressed, um, which means there, the software isn't taking shortcuts or like, you know, um, it's trying to shrink the file size. It's keeping the full file size. PDFs um, are often include images of the, of the data. So um, whereas a Word document might need that specific version of Word in order to open the document, in theory, a PDF is, more, is less concerned about the version of Adobe or Acrobat Reader you have. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my sense. You, you know, if you're um, storing a PDF, you're best off storing it as a PDF. All right, if you have a document, you're best off storing it as a PDF. Um, the other thing is, um, and I don't think I mentioned this in any of the slides, but the digital archive will convert certain formats into the preferred format um, where, where necessary. So I. I'm pretty sure, although not 110% positive, that if you have a document, it might convert it um, on our behalf. But we try to take that out of the question. We try to only start with the materials that we know are appropriate for the digital archive. So we, we do that kind of before we send it. There's a deeper conversation about PDFs that I don't want to necessarily get into right now, but there is a difference between a um, PDF and a PDF A, which is an archival PDF, which in theory has more of the built-in information of how to open the file than a traditional PDF does. Um, I tend to produce PDF A's because there's some indication that those are gonna be more future-proof, but I know some of my colleagues at other councils feel differently, so they're like shun, shun PDF A's, so like, I, I don't wanna speak too, too definitively about that, but PDF, PDFs for documents, images would tend to be more TIFF file. But on the flip side, if you're generating um, a TIFF file or a PDF from another document, sometimes that still might be your, your document or record. A little larger conversation there, and I'd, I'd be happy to like consult on more of an individual case by case basis um, if you have like further questions. But yeah, that's, that's a long answer to maybe what you're looking for a short clarification. Um, Getting back to this, um, digital area does fixity checks. Um, this gets back to um, something I brought up earlier in an earlier slide, bit rot. Um, if your files are gradually changing over um, you know, a long period of time, uh, that's um, essentially a lapse in fixity. Fixity means your document is the same throughout time. It's not changing in any way. And so by doing fixity checks, I'll talk about the mechanics of this a little bit later, but the fixity checks will ensure that 
um, your file hasn't been degraded or, or corrupted over time. You can think of it even as like, the, you know, if it has a, if like you pull out a, a thumb drive as you're saving something and only half the file is saved, it might look like a full file, but it's not. Uh, Fixity check would, would say, oh, those aren't the same file. The, the file has been degraded, you know, throw up a red flag and you can, you can uh, address it. Um, okay, so then, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, limited file formats accepted. So um, we're really trying to limit and, and better manage what file formats we're taking into the system so that we have more um, uniformity when somebody opens it up 20 years from now or whatever, um, that they don't have this hodgepodge of formats they can read and can't read. It'll, if it's all the same format or all the same two or three formats, then um, it's a lot easier. Anybody who's worked in an archive that includes audiovisual materials and they have, you know, um, 78s, LPs, tapes, you know, um, pneumatic, like all these different film, film formats, that's a big challenge. They have to have a reader for every single one of those. If this is unrealistic, but if they said, oh, we only take pneumatic, then they only need a pneumatic um, film projector and they can um, kind of concentrate on that. So we, we have a little bit more flexibility there with the digital, with digital files than we would um, with like tape and, and film. Uh, and finally, the, the, another difference is um, the concept of, of uh, so one thing I mentioned earlier, this is, this is like the backup to your backup. This is your copy of last resort. If everything got wiped away and you need to go back to this file, um, you'd go to the digital archive. You just like need to access it to give, to, give it to a patron, you probably go to your, your local copies. Um, so I'm gonna, we'll talk a little bit more about why that's the case later. Um, and you know, they, they do have something in common. I, I, I thought this like middle part of the Venn diagram is gonna be larger than it ended up being, but you know, they're both additional copies. These are both additional copies for your materials. These are both like your, you know, you might have it in New York Heritage and several other places. This is one of those several other places. And another thing that, um, at least from a traditional archival practice standpoint, um, digital files, if, unless they're born digital, are not the object of record. That's, that's to say, if you digitize a collection of newspapers, archival best practice would say, don't throw out the, the physical copies. Those are your copy of record. The digital copies are, are um, more like a backup than, than um, the original. And so, Traditional archival practice would dictate that you should keep your physical copies. I know a lot of folks see digitization as preservation in and of itself, um, but really, if you're following best practices for archival um, practice, um, it's a pretty If you say if you're, if you're following best practices, you would keep the physical and you'd you'd have you know the the digital files as well. That being said, there's other realities and the world is an imperfect place. You wouldn't necessarily always follow that, but just know that that's the, that's the best advice from experts. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through really quickly the procedure that we take to prepare something for, for the digital archive. This is more to have you understand what the scope of our work is and less for you to like take notes and like, you know, understand this to the letter. Um, because the idea here and, you know, at least for the foreseeable future, we would be doing this work on your behalf. We wouldn't be asking you to do much or any of this, um, not, you know, at least at this point, we'll, we'll, you know, in the future maybe. Um, so our first step is to, we're mostly doing stuff from, from New York Heritage. We'll export all the metadata from New York Heritage. This is best because if you made edits after the upload or if, um, or if there's any changes, the, the metadata in New York Heritage should be the, reflect the best copy of your metadata. Um, also, it includes other data that could be of interest in the future. So there's URLs or URIs that, um, at least in the near term, you can click on that URL and it'll bring you to the, the page in, in Content Dam in, in New York Heritage where that um, photograph exists. So um, we, we export from Content DM, 
we, we then take all the files that we're going to include in the package and organize them in a directory, usually with the institution's name. So um, the example I'm going to use later is New Woodstock. New Woodstock has a folder. Within New Woodstock's folder, we have a folder for each one of their collections in New York Heritage at the time of our upload. Um, and the third step we take is making sure that what we have in the metadata matches what we have in the directory. So um, this is mostly to make sure that we're not missing any files or that um, there's not a discrepancy between what we have for the files and what we have in the metadata from kind of the end. That discrepancy would probably set off a red flag and help us you know, know where to look for um, to, to fix things. So that's a really important step. Um, and then next week we divide the collections out, we divide the, the metadata out by collection. So when we export the metadata from content DM, it's your entire institution's collect, um, materials all in one spreadsheet. We then take it, copy and paste it into separate spreadsheets because we're really trying to have the unit of preservation be the collection. Um, the main reason for this is I feel it will be easier to, to, to um, look at in the future with less context to have things divided out like that. Um, and that's the way we're treating your materials in New York Heritage. That's the way we should treat it in a, in a preservation sense. Again, um, please chime in if I, if you want more clarification on any of this. I'm, you know, it's, uh, again, mostly that I want to understand, you understand the basic process. The next step we, we take is we make a readme file. So this is kind of our guide to this um, package. So um, we, I tend to pull, or Ashley and I, because Ashley, um, our digital collections, our digital uh, projects um, assistant um, helps me with a lot of this. We um, will pull your landing page information down. Um, so that will be backed up with, with your materials. Hopefully that will um, uh, help somebody looking at it in the future understand the context of what they're looking at. I kind of feel sometimes like we're the, you know, the, was it the discovery probe or whatever, where they have like all the, the, um, the golden disc of, of materials that they put out in the probe going out to outer space. Like we want to try to convey everything that we can about what they're looking at and, and what, what our current perspectives are on these materials so that whoever finds them in the future will, will know what they're looking at. It's kind of a grandiose example, but there are, uh, comparison, but you get the idea. Um, so uh, next step, step six, we um, make an inventory spreadsheet that lists the contents of the package. So this is like how many PDFs we have, how many TIFF files we have. And this is one of the requirements from Zero Guide from their, their um, system. And again, I think it's, it's mostly to um, double check that they have the number of files that they expect to, that nothing got lost in transfer. Also, this is helpful because um, this will be accessible to somebody looking at the record so they can know whether they wanna pull down the data. Um, so yeah, the, the, again, trying to describe as, as, in as many ways and as thoroughly as possible what, what's in these packages. Um, the next step is uh, creating a basic double core record for the package. This is like super rudimentary, but um, this is something, I think it's a requirement of Archive Manica, which is the platform we use to put it all together. Um, so again, another way of describing what's in the package. Uh, and finally, uh, we try to do our best to, uh, to do it right the first time. And usually we like, if Ashley spent all our time um, putting together everything, I will do a final look over, second set of eyes to make sure that uh, we didn't miss anything. We didn't make any errors. Um, so again, we are confusing the future peoples. Uh, okay, so that's our process. I'm going to get a little bit more into the, the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and again, this is run by Southeastern. So I am piecing this together from my best understanding of the process. I don't touch this side of the process. This is something that um, the Jen and Zach at Southeastern handle on our behalf. Um, so Archive Manica is the platform that we're using to um, package the materials. Actually, it's called, um, they're, they're referred to as bags. So a bag is a collection of folders that is like sent off to, to deep storage. Um, and uh, 
it also helps us track and manage these, these bags, these, these packages that we're sending on to the storage. It generates uh, checksums, which verify fixity. So that's a lot of jargon. Basically what that's saying is, um, well, I'll explain what a checksum is first. Checksum is um, a fingerprint for the file. So um, it's a long string of characters that um, if something in the file changes, that string of characters will change. So the, um, it's basically something to check against um, to make sure that nothing changed in the file. So um, the, in order to generate a checksum, the software will say, will like run it through an algorithm and spit out, a, I don't know how long this, the, the set of characters are. And then every time it wants to know that the file hasn't changed, it'll say, it'll do that process again and compare the checksums. Are the checksums the same? Yes, your file is just as you put it, just as it was when you put it in. Are they different? Uh-oh, red flag. And then you go through and you know, either automatically the software will handle it or a uh, human set of eyes goes and looks to see where the problem is. Because the checksum won't tell you what's wrong. It is say, these two checksums aren't the same. Something is different. Take a look at this. Um, and oftentimes that just means go back to another version of the file and pull that in. Um, okay, yeah. And uh, Archive Medica processes the files. Um, puts them in bags and um, prepares them for submission to Amazon Glacier. Amazon Glacier um, sounds like, I don't know, Amazon's kind of like this evil empire these days. So it sounds like some kind of like secret supervillain lab or something. But really what Amazon Glacier is, is like deep storage um, for, as part of their Amazon Web Services wing. So Amazon Web Services, kind of basically the backbone of a good portion of the web. So this is where a lot of things are hosted. They have a lot of storage. Um, and Glacier is their storage that's designed for archival, long-term storage and low access. So they're not, you're not, um, a lot of Amazon Web Services is, um, when, when Amazon when, um, Web Services goes down, half the web goes down. Twitter might go down, or I can't remember what other ones are on there, but um, you know, major websites will go down because that's where they're hosted. They're hosted through Amazon Web. Um, and, and as a user of the internet, you're, you're pinging that every day. But Glacier is, is kind of the, the, you know, touch it every once in a while. You know, don't, only, only grab that, those files if you need them. Um, so the way that it's designed is it's super cheap per, oops, I can't highlight things. It's super cheap per gigabyte. So, um, and this is, this is one, one of the cost uh, models. There's, Several. If you look on their, their page, you can see there's different um, cost brackets. But for instance, um, under one, it's four tenths of a cent per gigabyte for storage per month. And um, if you need to retrieve the file, it's um, they charge you a quarter of a cent per gigabyte to get the fi your files back. So there is there is a charge to get the files back. That's part of the reason why these are the copies in last resort. You pay that fee because everything else is gone and you want to recover your data. Um, and if you want it faster than like a few days, then you might pay more than um, 0 0.0025 cents per gigabyte, whatever. Um, so being, being an Amazon product and being um, as part of Amazon Web Services, it's a cloud-based storage. Um, so you are, you're already taking that box where it's offsite, you're not, you know, it's not in your network storage in your closet in the back room. It's completely out of, you know, it's out of state actually. So our, our server is in Virginia. Um, so, you know, if you look at um, a lot of guidance on, on how to back up stuff, you want to have your materials in different disaster areas. Sounds kind of apocalyptic, but basically, you know, if a, if a snowstorm hits central New York, it probably won't also hit Virginia or like, you know, for the most part, things are, you know, you're in a different, um, I would think more of it like, you know, if we are in California, we want something that's not, you know, gonna have an earthquake at the same time we do. So our, our server's in, in Virginia. Um, another thing that Amazon does for us is they do a lot of this checksum checking as well. Um, so there's really high level of data durability. So the bit rot um, is managed within Amazon um, without us, doing those checksums or checking, 
verifying the checksums on a regular basis. So they also keep redundant copies. Um, and if there is a problem with one copy, they'll, use, they'll replace it with the copy that's good. Um, and as a result, they claim 99 point bunch of nines percent um, durability. I have no idea how they get that many nines and not just say 100%. But um, I guess they're, you know, if the asteroid comes or something, I don't know. But um, they're, they're saying that on an annual basis, their data will be free from any errors to that degree. Um, and that's part of their, uh, you know, guarantee, if you will. Um, so that's pretty good. That's much better than we could say locally. Our, you know, our local durability is, I won't well, hazard a guess, but not 99.99999. So that, that's, there's, there's many advantages to do it, doing it like this. Um, and our, our files are tucked away in a server somewhere. Um, and then also there's other copies that are elsewhere in the world. Um, so the councils cover the storage costs for New York Heritage materials, as I mentioned before. If you wanted, if you, especially if you're a larger institution, you have like a institutional repository or something else you'd want to um, store and have a, a more robust backup and you don't have that system in place for your institution, you know, we can talk and I'd be happy to, you know, see, see what we can do for you. Um, but the good news is for most people who are really um, producing stuff mostly for New York Heritage, uh, we, we have you covered. I won't say that we're very good about um, getting to the legacy stuff. We're kind of doing it as we're, as we're digitizing, but Maybe in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna really quickly, because I don't wanna spend too long on this, show an example. So this is the very first collection that we prepared for the Digital Art Archive. Our staging ground was, was Google Drive. The benefits of this are that we can um, uh, share this with Southeastern. Our file, the, the contributions that we've made so far haven't been so large that putting it in Google Drive hasn't been an issue. Also, I can take this and I can share this with all, I can share this with you, with the institution once it's done. And here's your, here are all your files neatly organized with all the readme and everything else. So if you're keeping a backup copy, you can keep this copy. So as you can see um, in this like general um, directory, um, we have uh, our, this is the output that shows up. Not. This is the output from Archivematica confirming everything. You know, if you really looked at this, you could read it. Some of it's human readable. Um, um, but more, more importantly, here's our inventory. So this is, this is you know, our inventory for, for the submission. Um, so, you, you know, this, what's there, what formats, and you know, brief descriptions, nothing too intense. And then each collection has a folder with all the objects and it's taking a long time to load. Um, so I'll only show one of these. If, if we had this, so this collection doesn't have any, but if there were compound objects or, or groups of objects, then we would um, have subfolders within this. So you see all the, um, individual files. These are JPEGs. Um, that's what was produced. So um, we don't have TIFFs that are, like are the original copy. So upgrading to TIFF would wouldn't necessarily increase the the quality of the storage. And JPEG is also considered to be not an ideal storage media, but it's it's universally used enough that it's it, st it should stand the test of time. Um, and here is our metadata for. The, um, the collection, you know, this is the output from content DM divided out. Uh, not too much to see there. And then we have a readme. This is what I was describing earlier where we have, click. Ah, I don't know if it's because I'm streaming my, pay, my um, screen or something, but it's especially slow. Oh, right, there it goes. Um, I'm offline. That does not seem likely. <laughs> uh, well, um, this is where we have the uh, description with the, the um, 
the uh, information from the landing page. I'm not going to wait for that to come up. I don't know why that's happening. But we'll, you get the, you get the sense for what I'm what we're doing here. So again, it's not rocket science. We try to do it carefully and deliberately. Um, but it was really intimidating putting it together. But then once we did it, it was okay. We can, you know, once we once we develop that that those steps that I outlined earlier, we, we have um, have it put in place. Okay, this is what I was talking about earlier where we, where, um, we could discuss um, contributing non-New York Heritage materials. This is the same um, sliding scale incidentally that we pay for the storage. Um, so this is put in place by Southeastern to cover their costs. And um, honestly, it's like still very cheap. So um, really, so far we haven't broken over a hundred gigabytes. So we're, every, every year we pay them a hundred dollars for this this service. And they'll build, they build this in this July for the previous fiscal year of, of storage. So if in the course of this year we go over um, 100, we get, then, then they'll build us in next July for $200. So the same would be for, for you if you were um, contributing non New York Heritage materials. So it's pretty cost effective, um, but uh, you know, could be very valuable. So like an insurance policy, you don't really want to have to use it, but if, if you had to, it would be in place and, uh, you know, we'd go from there. Okay, and I guess that's all I had. So um, I'm going to not repeat my mistake from last time. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody want me to like go in, in more depth in any of this? Um, it's kind of a basic introduction and, you know, you can take a whole course or a whole webinar or a long webinar on, on visitor preservation. Uh, but I want to at least give people a sense for what it is we're talking about and what we're doing. So um, if you have a question, feel free to go on microphone and chime in or type it in. Okay, cool. Um, we will do another 10 minute break. Um, so we can break it up a little bit. And actually it is, I might do a, I might do a five minute break. Let's do a five minute break. Cause I wanna make sure we have some time for conversation. Um, now, again, I'm recording the entire event, but that's mostly so I don't have to try to take notes while I'm facilitating the conversation that we're gonna have. Um, so when I share this out, I will cut it before this. All right, so let's do a five minute break um, and come back at uh, 3.15. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, like I said, I, I also hope to reach out to everybody by the end of the year, but I appreciate at least all of you for sitting through this and getting you know, some of the updates and, and all that. Um, and hopefully we can work work together in some capacity and get, get jumpstart on some more of these projects and, you know, Keep, keep moving forward and best, best of luck to everybody as you continue to reopen and, and everything changes and things hopefully get, get better um, and uh, stay, stay healthy and you know if you need anything. Bye everyone.